Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Wheelock. I'm the medical director for the medical group uh, here in the Columbia Network. Uh, we're having this uh, town hall today uh, to focus on questions uh, surrounding uh, the vaccine and concerns about the safety of the vaccine and concerns about uh, side effects and uh, you know what 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 if I'm pregnant or breastfeeding and those and those types of questions uh, will not really be addressing. Um, any issues around uh, testing or treatment uh, during this town hall. But if you did send in questions or have questions about that, uh, those responses will, uh, or those questions will get directed to the right folks and uh, you'll get a response uh, via email. Um, the information you hear today um, will not be a substitute uh, for any conversation you may wanna have uh, with your primary care physician and uh, the last thing I would uh, just share with the group is as uh, Peace Health caregivers, we've had a period of relative exclusivity uh, in terms of access to the vaccine and with the upcoming mass vaccination events, uh, that window may be closing. So just again, so you're aware your access to the vaccine may be shifting uh, in the coming weeks. Um, so with that, that's the uh, summary of topics. Uh, I'd like to uh, start us off with um, one of our intensivists uh, talking about uh, her experience, both in terms of uh, getting COVID herself and then also with dealing with patients who get very sick from it. Thank you, Dr. Vila. This is Dr. Krishna, and I'm one of the intensivists at Peace Health, um, and I unfortunately got COVID-19 sometime in the middle of July. Uh, and it was unlike any other viral illness that I'd had before. I was unlucky enough to get sick from it, but I was fortunate enough to not end up in a hospital with it. My symptoms sort of started off with fever, some body pain and a dry cough, but it very quickly progressed to me being short of breath. And as a young, healthy, otherwise not sick person with no medical problems, to feel short of breath when you walk two steps from your bed, that's just not a good feeling. And I've often been asked and I wondered myself, this, this is, how is this different from anything else that I've ever had? And, and it was different. Um, one of them was that the fevers that I had with it was not what you would get with a viral illness. It was 104, 105, and it wouldn't break just with a few doses of Tylenol. And the sense of smell that I lost with it, I still seven months out, haven't gotten it back yet. And that's very disorienting. And you know, most flus come in as an upper respiratory tract infection and they go away. But then when you get short of breath and I sort of feel, feel like I possibly had a pneumonia, to get pneumonia from a viral illness as a young fit person is it, not okay. It's, it's not normal. It's not like the others. And, and I think the biggest part of the, of the whole process that was causing me a lot of anxiety as someone who got COVID-19 was that I, I was worried I would give it to my family. I was worried when I would see my six-year-old and my two-year-old across the, the bedroom looking at me, wondering why isn't she coming to me? Why isn't she talking to us? And, and that, that fear that you will transmit it to others is, is real and it can be very disturbing too. And fortunately for me, it ended well. I got better in about 10 to 12 days and by the 14th day, I was back at work. And But I knew that this was just random chance and this wasn't, uh, this wasn't the norm always and it, and it could have gone anywhere. Uh, and I think that's the most important message that I took home, that the, we have to stop the spread of this disease and and uh, and anything that gave us a shot at it, I was going to take it. And the vaccine gives us a shot at it. You know, the specific concerns about taking vaccine after getting COVID-19, I think I, I took it because I wanted to boost my immune system's ability to respond to this virus if I was to be exposed to it again. I also didn't check my antibody titer at any part of this disease because there is no clear guidance on what to do with that information. And there is a good scientific reason for us to believe that if you are antibody negative, you may still have a good cell mediated immune response and an immune system with a memory with it, which would get boosted if you take the vaccine. So I think whether or not you have COVID-19, one must take the vaccine because it improves your chances of fighting it if you get it again. But then I think as an intensivist who has seen patients in the ICU, Dr. Vilav, do you want me to talk about that now? Uh, uh -huh. Yes, if you could, could that would be great. Yeah, yeah. I think I've spent almost all of last year exclusively seeing patients with COVID-19, and I see, 
you know, and it's not a good feeling when you see the same disease pathology over and over again in your ICU. And I unfortunately see the worst end of the uh, spectrum of the illness. If one is sick enough to come to the ICU with COVID-19 COVID and end up on a ventilator, the statistics are stark. They show that six out of 10 people will not survive. And this is a number that is true across all age groups with or without medical problems. And I think that number six out of 10 not surviving on a ventilator with COVID-19 is a conservative number. I think the number is worse, much worse than that. And these odds actually get worse if someone is older, somebody is obese, or if they have even one medical problem to start off with. And we often hear about COVID-19 affecting the lungs, which it does. And a large number of patients who get sick with this disease end up with irreversible lung scarring, which the ventilator cannot fix. But in addition to that, we see a whole host of other medical problems, too. They end up with clots in their legs, clots in their lungs, strokes, brain bleeds. And the few who survive this have prolonged courses of delirium and profound weakness. I mean, it will be years before any of us who work with these patients uh, will forget the image of these patients. These otherwise healthy, real people with families and homes who are between the ages of 40 to 60 who are just lying there in an ICU prone on their belly with breathing tubes, with getting dialysis, getting whole dose, heavy doses of sedation and paralysis. It is so dehumanizing for weeks together with a very poor outcome at the end. And all of this because of a virus, which we now possibly have a chance to, to get over it. And I just think when we get the shot at it, we should take it because it's heartbreaking how most of these folks get it. They get it from asymptomatic carriers or from young people with minor illnesses who give it to them. And we don't even let any of these family members come by and see them. But the vaccine offers us a safe and effective way to do it. And to those of us who worry the vaccine is safe, I, I worried about it too. And, I, and I'm not an immunologist. I'm not an infectious disease doctor. I did a lot of reading on it because my concern was that is it too quick? Did they come up with this vaccine too fast? But, you know, they honestly didn't because scientists have been studying this family of coronavirus for a long time. And the reason it came out quickly was because now we have better technology to isolate, replicate, and manufacture this RNA that is needed to make this vaccine. And this technology has been available to us for about six to seven years now. They made the Zika virus and the Ebola virus vaccine with this technology. We just didn't know about it because we didn't have to deal with any other pandemic of this scale before. And in terms of side effects, I just had localized side effects in my arm with some swelling and pain and a fever for two to three days. And my second dose, I, I didn't even feel a whole lot. And life-threatening anaphylaxis is so rare from what I read, and I'm sure others in the panel are experts at this. I mean, it seems to have been only 25 people out of five to seven million who have got the vaccine or gotten life-threatening anaphylaxis. So I, I don't think that should, should hold us back either. And the effectiveness is 90 to 95 percent. That's a big number for vaccine effectiveness. And there aren't that many vaccines that offer that effectiveness. So I just can't wait to go back to a time when I don't just see COVID-19 patients in the ICU. I can't wait to go back to a time when my children go to school and to playgrounds and I, I, I don't have to worry about them or their teachers. And I think the vaccine gives us an escape route and we should take it. That's all I have to say. Th thank you so much uh, for sharing that, and uh, that's a great segue to delve a little more into the uh, safety of the vaccine. And uh, you know, there's obviously it's a messenger RNA vaccine, and people are concerned. Well, what does that do? Well, I would start by just saying we've all been exposed to messenger RNA recurrently throughout our entire lives. Anytime any of us have gotten the common cold the RNA from that virus is getting into our cells and that's how it's how it's replicating. So uh, start with that as context. Um, I believe, uh, Dr. Root, you're still on the phone, correct? Yes. Yeah, so I don't know if you want to speak a little bit to, uh, you know, the safety of the uh, uh, vaccine and a little bit about how the vaccine was developed uh, for our audience. Thank you. Sure, yeah. So this is Andy Root. I'm one of the uh, infectious disease docs at Vancouver Clinic and, and I see patients at, uh, at Peace Health. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the way the vaccine works, uh, in messenger RNA, um, which basically provides instruction for, for a, a protein, um, is, uh, uh, is uh, delivered via this um, 
a lipid nanoparticle. And so that gets taken into our cells, um, a macrophage cell, um, but it stays in the cytoplasm. And so that's, you know, when we can worry about it intermingling with our DNA, it, it doesn't do that because our DNA is in the nucleus. So messenger RNA is in the cytoplasm. And basically this instructs our uh, cells, the ribosomes to um, to produce uh, the spike protein, which is part of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And, uh, and then that protein is uh, taken to the surface of the cell and it's presented to our other uh, white blood cells to basically induce an immune response that's analogous to natural infection. Um, so that's how it works. And, and with that, you know, there, there's really no way for the messenger RNA to get incorporated into our DNA. That's not possible. And the messenger RNA gets degraded rapidly uh, by enzymes within our cytoplasm, so it doesn't hang around. Um, you know, so I, I mean, I think overall in terms of safety, you know, what, what we know is that um, uh, these vaccines the, fr from Pfizer and Moderna have been studied in, you know, upper, upwards of 70,000 patients in the two clinical trials, um, and they appear to be very safe. Um, of course, there are, you know, <clears throat> reasonably common uh, symptoms like soreness at the injection site, fatigue, um, some some folks experience things like chills and um, more uh, significant symptoms, but overall safety is very good. Um, you know, I, I think uh, we don't we don't yet have long term data because it just hasn't been long enough for that. Um, but <clears throat> you know, uh, I, I've been you know listened to a lot of interviews and and read thing, a lot of things myself and. Um, you know, I think one of the most reassuring things I've heard was uh, there, there's a, a physician named Paul Offit, who's kind of a nationally renowned expert, and he's on the um, ACIP, uh, the uh, advisory panel uh, for um, for vaccines. And uh, what he pointed out was that he and his colleagues really aren't aware of any vaccine throughout our history that, that has had um, serious adverse effects that weren't apparent within the first six to eight weeks after receipt. And so now we've got you know, at this point, um, not only those 70 plus thousand folks who are in the, the trial, but, um, you know, millions of folks now that have received doses of vaccine over the past few weeks. And uh, uh, and so, so far, things look uh, very, very safe. Thank you, Dr. Root. Uh, Dr. Neville, would you like to speak to some of the uh, questions that have arose about, you know, what if I'm immune, immune compromised uh, or have some other condition that might put me at risk uh, to get the vaccine? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Wheelock, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. So um, uh, we got a bunch of questions in, as Dr. Wheelock mentioned, so I want to try to answer a few of them. So one of them is, you're immunocompromised. Uh, is it safe to get the vaccine? The way to think about almost all these questions is, what's the risk of getting the vaccine versus the risk of getting COVID, and what, what comes with COVID? So in general, I want to be really clear about this. If you're immunocompromised, you should get the vaccine because if you get COVID, you're gonna do poorly uh, because of being immunocompromised. Now that said, you do wanna talk to your doctor about when to do it uh, if you're immunocompromised because some of the treatments uh, that you might be receiving to make you immunocompromised uh, can affect how well the vaccine works. So you may wanna time it just right, but if the timing is right, you wanna get vaccinated. So it, it's really important to get vaccinated. Um, I also want to speak about MS because it's a common question uh, with uh, vaccines. And I've got MS. Uh, MS is an autoimmune disease. Will getting a vaccine trigger an MS flare? And we've actually studied this a lot with other vaccines. Uh, if you've got MS, uh, you should get vaccinated just like anybody else. So, for example, it's really important to get your flu vaccine. And uh, we know that you're gonna do, again, less well with COVID. So it's pretty important to get vaccinated. Uh, it's also the case, you know, let's say you've had Bell's palsy in the past, which, you know, a lot of us have had, or even God forbid Guillain-Barre, it's still important to get vaccinated. And um, we've done a lot of uh, looking as neurologists at the patients who've gotten the vaccine, and it does not seem to cause these neurological problems more than anybody else in the general population. So uh, really reassuring and uh, please do get the vaccine. The one caveat I wanna make is if you've had a severe reaction, like an anaphylactoid reaction, a bad reaction to prior vaccines, you really wanna pause and uh, make sure that you talk to an expert doctor before going ahead. But in almost all other situations, doing uh, the vaccine and doing it at the right time is really important. 
Thank you, Dr. Neville. Uh, Dr. Higgins, if you could speak a little bit to, uh, you know, thoughts of someone who is either pregnant uh, and or breastfeeding, uh, what considerations you would want people to take in terms of the vaccine? Sure, I'd be glad to address that. Um, as always with pregnant patients, we have to weigh the risk versus the benefit of anything that we do during pregnancy. And the risks of getting COVID while you're pregnant are definitely more than when you're not pregnant. So people that get COVID when they're pregnant are five times more likely to end up in the ICU um, or on a ventilator than patients who aren't pregnant. Um, Preterm labor may also be associated with getting COVID while pregnant. And women that get COVID while they're pregnant are more likely to die of the disease than non-pregnant women of the same age. So um, when we're thinking about those risks, um, the benefit of, of the vaccine, of, of course, we know that we can't get COVID from the vaccine. It doesn't contain any part of the live virus. Um, and Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of safety data yet with the vaccine in pregnant women, um, but we are used to giving vaccines in pregnancy, and the only ones that we avoid are vaccines that have attenuated or live virus. So um, I, am, I am a little concerned about side effects during pregnancy, especially if someone gets a high fever in the first trimester. That can, can sometimes cause um, birth defects. So it may be wise to wait until after the first trimester to get the vaccine to avoid some of those side effects. However, if you do get fever, taking Tylenol can help with that and not, not decrease the, the benefit of the vaccine. Um, so for a lot of my pregnant women, I'm saying the decision should be based on your own personal risk. Um, if you're over 35 or you have other medical um, problems, um, or obesity, or you're a healthcare worker, then it probably makes sense to go ahead and get the vaccine while you're pregnant. If you're not at high risk for COVID and you can maintain social distance and work remotely, and there's not a high risk of the virus in your community, then those, those patients that are pregnant might want to wait and get more information. Um, we're not concerned at all about um, giving the COVID vaccine to lactating women that uh, since there's no live virus, there's no risk for the baby. Um, so I'm, I'm saying most breastfeeding moms should go ahead and get the vaccine. And um, in summary, if COVID does seem to cause more harm in pregnant women than in women of the same age who aren't pregnant. So the risks of the COVID vaccine during pregnancy are thought to be small, but not totally known. And considering your own personal risk of COVID should enter into your decision. And ultimately, whether or not to get the vaccine while you're pregnant is your choice. Thank you, Dr. Higgins. Uh, and lastly, uh, if I could ask you, Dr. Wooden, to speak a little bit to uh, you know, the, the thought that, hey, I'm, I'm fairly young and healthy, you know, should I really be concerned about getting COVID, uh, you know, and should I be getting the vaccine? And then also just the, the safety of our work environment if a larger group of us all get the vaccine and kind of what that does for us, uh, both on a day-to-day -day level, but even on an emotional level, how that can impact us if we have a greater chunk of our work population getting the vaccine. Thanks, Dr. Relock. So I think, um, you know, I work in an outpatient setting and I've seen a lot of patients be afraid to come to our clinic, be afraid to go to the hospital. I've had to arm twist on call to get patients with chest pain to show up um, to seek care. And so having our staff be completely immunized makes our work setting safer for patients and it also makes it safer for us. We all have uh, parents. I have an elderly mother who is high risk and has been isolating at home. I'm very excited to have been vaccinated so that I can start to feel more comfortable seeing her and spending some time with her as well. Um, the social isolation has been really challenging on our elderly patients um, and our entire community. Even here in the office where I can't walk down the hall without wearing a mask, where we can't eat lunch together, um, 
we're really looking forward to that time being over. And I think the only way to get there and the fastest way to get there is for everybody to be vaccinated. Well, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, are there any uh, additional thoughts that any member of the panel uh, wants to speak to uh, around side effects or concerns of safety or impacts uh, on patients uh, about the vaccine? Thanks, Dr. Wheelock. I want, I want to speak to one thing, and you know, those of you who know me know I, I tell it straight. Um, so here's the bad news. The bad news is the variant of COVID has been detected in Multnomah County. This variant is 50% more contagious, and the CDC is predicting this variant will be the predominant strain by March. Now, if that's true, fingers crossed it's not, the time to get vaccinated, frankly, brothers and sisters, is now, because if you wait till that's the predominant strain, it's, it's gonna be everywhere, and it's gonna be very difficult. So sorry to put out something that's sort of a, a, a reality check, but that, that's, that's something out there looming. And I really, as someone who cares about you, urge you to consider vaccinating now rather than putting it off. Thanks, Dr. Wheelock. Thank you. Uh, so we have a couple minutes left. Is there anything else that uh, any of uh, the panel members wanted to bring to uh, the attention of the audience? Okay. So I, I guess in closing, um, what I wanted to uh, just thank ever, all the panel members for, for uh, speaking today and kind of giving their own uh, personal uh, interactions. Uh, and we've all had interactions, as was alluded to, with patients, with personal experience, whether you've had the virus or not. We all probably know people who have. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, it can impact all all ages, obviously, that the risk is certainly higher on the higher age range patients. Uh, but we have had we have seen severe illness in younger patients. And even as a younger uh, person, your, your risk of exposure to others is obviously still there. Um, so uh, with that, uh, again, if you do have additional questions, uh, feel free to email those in and we will get responses back to you uh, via email. Uh, but in summary, you know, it, it's a it's a safe vaccine. Um, the process that this vaccine went through um, is similar to other vaccines. The time course was compressed largely due to financial considerations because the manufacturers had no financial risk. Uh, in this situation because the government was just giving them the money, whereas normally uh, a company won't go through this process in a hurry and then be millions of dollars in the hole. So that's what allowed this. And then as was mentioned also, there was a lot of uh, research around these technologies going back uh, decades uh, that uh, allowed this to, to happen in a, in a faster manner than, than normal. So, uh, uh, so thank you again uh, for uh, participating uh, and listening in. And uh, please feel free to, uh, again, talk with your primary care doctors, uh, talk with the people that you work with, um, and continue to have conversations uh, so you're getting your, your questions answered. So thank you.